podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Welcome to the Ospreys Irie. Hello and welcome back to the Ospreys Irie podcast. Uh, I'm James. Uh, joining me as always is Yestin. And Robbie, boys, how are we? I'm I'm doing good. Yeah, it's been been a, an eventful last couple of days. I'm in the middle of writing the slowest main talking points of a Welsh squad ever, and it's going so slowly <laughs> that it might not even be published tomorrow morning. So I'm not going to say it's going to be published tomorrow morning because that's how slow it's going. But um, yeah, it's been a, an eventful uh, couple of days. I, I if you see me on any other podcast, like. I don't know baseball or NFL. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that that could easily happen. I don't know. Yeah, I haven't even lined up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Robbie, have you been drafted to like another like podcast? Yeah, like, that's it. Um, player program. I'm actually going to Kabaddi now. <laughs> no one saw this coming. I'm <laughs> taking up oh. Kabaddi <laughs> full time. Not like even not even covering it. Not even Kabaddi. The Squidge Kabaddi. That isn't even starting. No, I'm just going to be playing Kabaddi professionally. For um, Kabaddi teams, uh, the world's top Kabaddi teams, uh, the Bengal Warriors, I'm going to be playing for, um, in the, the Pro Kabaddi League, <laughs> the Celtic Warriors. <laughs> We're bringing them back. It's me and Matthew Kabaddi Reese. And We're Kabaddi playing Kabaddi. Kabaddi. You, Tal Selly, Matthew Reese. <laughs> And we're done. And Owen Robbins himself. And Owen Robbins, yeah. But, but where's the going to be played? That's, that's the important question. <laughs> we're going to play road. Yeah, in Owen Robbins' back garden. <laughs> and 18,000 people will show up wearing t shirts that say the word affinity. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I love this podcast, man. Um, yeah. Yeah. Welcome back. It's been another. Huge. It's never quite a week in Welsh rugby. Everyone knows this. Um, uh, let let me just put one thing out there very quickly. I, I've had to disclaim this week on the on the on the the X account, the Twitter account, that we are merely a shit posting account. We we are not here to be like serious journalists or serious stat people. You can leave that to Scarlets and Cardiff. Like, let them bicker about their stadiums and their their attendances. We are here to 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 merely post memes and occasionally when I remember to post the link to the podcast. Um, please do not tarnish us with, with this brush. Um, but yeah, we are uh, lo- loads and loads and loads of stuff to cover and some uh, really exciting announcements, uh, which I might I might announce at the start, but I'll definitely announce at the end as well. Uh, let's move on to the news. Let's start. Should we start with the bad news first? Well, which bad news? Where yeah, do we begin? All, all, everyone is injured. Uh, so uh, prior to the game against the French council workers on Friday, George North pulled out with uh, an, an illness. It's not the first time this season he's done that. Please, someone get him some vitamins and minerals. Um, get him on the Omega oil. Do you think that's you know, why he's off the south of France for the vitamin D? Yeah, the, it's, it's clearly, this is not a transfer. It's, it's prescribed it's, by his GP. Yeah. Purely <laughs> medical, purely medical move. Get out I think what you camera. need is to go and sign for a pro day dud team. Said <laughs> no doctor ever. You're not going to have any eyes because it yeah. gouged out, but you will have great skin and a good immune system. What you need is fewer working jaws. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, and then two minutes, uh, five minutes into the game. Dewey Lake, who was named at open side flanker, uh, ruined everyone's dreams by uh, uh, what seems to be a low grade hamstring tear. Uh, we have no official confirmation on the length of his injury. I expect we'll find out more uh, in the press conference, which normally would be out today, but because we're playing on a Sunday and the Ospreys are now in South Africa, I don't know when that press conference is coming out. So, uh, Further on from that, James Fender, uh, straight dislocation on his shoulder. Um, I, I have actual sources about this because I, I actually messaged him and asked him, I was like, did you pop your shoulder? And he said, yes. 
Um, he has been spotted wearing a sling, uh, so we expect that to be minimum six weeks. Um, really gutted for him. He was having a great game. Um, he he literally went crowd surfing at one point. Was it him going crowd surfing or was it Hickey? Oh yeah, yes, yeah. Well, Hickey, yeah. Yeah, um, when you yeah they got picked up. So I imagine his mum could organise it if she just made a pop pop the message <laughs> on the Reddit. You know, a bit of a fender crowd surfing, please. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Fender's out. Uh, Garen Phillips picks up a knock again. We don't know mm. the um, the the, uh, the stuff around that. Gareth Thomas also picks up a knock. It's not serious enough to keep him out. Obviously, he's been named in the Welsh squad. More on that later. Um, but they weren't comfortable bringing him back on, meaning the game finished in uncontested scrums. Uh, anyone else get injured? Probably. Um, um did something. I don't know what he did. Who did? Dan Edwards. I think he, he, mm. he tried to kick a penalty, then something went a bit funny. And it might be cramp. Yeah, it could it could have uh, been but there's there's been nothing coming out of saying Dan Edwards is is gonna be he, he's traveled to South Africa, so I, I don't expect that to be I'm I might be overlooking everything because everyone else is injured, but yeah, this is true. But good. good good news, Will Hickey returned after twelve months. Mm. That was nice to see. Um a bit rusty here and there, but stats ways he had a really, really solid game. Um, a huge uh, travelling contingent of uh, Irish and, and fans it, over. Yeah, that is the most fans Leinster have brought in years. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, and a Sam Davis look like, which is my favourite thing. Mm. Yeah, from, um from, from ripping it up to the pro D to, to watching Osprey's Perpy on a Friday night. What what more but, but only think? only Will Hickey. Like he was there, yeah, just, just as a support, think, Will Hickey. It, do you think it was Sam Davis? But he didn't want to repeat with the Tulipi Falatel situation the other year, where Falatel went to the Liberty and everyone was like, he's signing for the Ospreys when he's just taking his kids on a day out because they fancied yeah. watching a game of rugby that day. And everyone assumed he signed for the Ospreys. And Sam Davis went, oh, I'm just going to do an Irish accent to pretend. I'm just going to see if I can get away with it if I put on a voice. I'm yeah. dragging a couple of friends from Ireland as well. Come yeah. along. This is a really deep cut, but it, I, I'm a big wrestling fan. And years ago, there was a um, a, a wrestler getting quite big on, on in WWE, and he decided to go watch a, a TNA show because they were being taped, uh, and his mate was in it. And TNA decided to be really spiteful and show him in the crowd and put nameplates up and everything. It essentially, like buried his career. He never did anything. I said so that's what they, they were trying to do with Falato all them years ago. This is what they're doing <laughs> with, with the Sam Davis look like now. And, and Andy Howell is going to be like having kittens and the fact that Sam Davis might be coming back. It's nailed on. It's nailed on. That entire squad, we're getting the band back together. Every Tom time. Tom Haverfield back I, alongside. I, I, every time I think of Sam Davis, right? I always think of Stuart Barnes. Yeah. Because when the Guinness Pro 14 and 12 had, was on Sky, they used to have. It was it was always Stuart Barnes and uh, Scott Cornell. They were the only two people allowed to do Osprey's coverage, and, and Stuart Barnes used to rave about Sam Davis, and he did have a weapon. Like he had a wand of a left foot. Everyone knows, mm. and he, he was one of the best tens in Wales, and only made better by bigger, uh, I think. Yeah, um, but that that's all I remember about Sam Davis it, it, it it, in an Osprey shirt. Such a weird era that Sky Sports Pro Twelve era. Because it feels like a separate pocket of time. Like in my head, they jumped from the BBC coverage to the Premier Sports coverage, and just something happened in the middle. All of those games feel fake now. It's just, it feels so strange in my head. Um, but as you say, yeah, it was always every week, Miles Harrison would say, and that's an okay kick from Sam Davis. Then Stuart Barnes would yeah. launch into how it was the greatest left foot hit he'd Super ever seen. Elite. It's basically how they talk about Freddie Stewart now. Yeah. But it's Sam Davis's left foot. I remember him shouting over and over again. He tried to coin the phrase that Dan Bigger was half a fullback. Hmm. <laughs> means he's a fly off, surely. There's there's little tidbits of that era, I remember. And and weirdly the all against Munster. Yeah, yeah same, and same, same. Because there's that one there's one at home where we were winning we won like seventy we were winning like seventeen nil or something. And Tyler Tyler Ardron, pulls, player of the match. Pulls back yes. this pass. Yeah. And I and actually like saw... A recommendation on my YouTube yeah. yesterday, and it was like someone made a a compilation mm. of that performance. Tyler Ruddy Darter, Ruddy Darter, Ruddy Darter. Ruddy Darter. Ruddy Darter. now the tier two rugby guy on Twitter. Yeah, which 
oh man he's a fascinating character i'm slightly obsessed with it. anyone that's listened to the squid ruby retrospective podcast i did we got ruddy data is a reoccurring character there it's he's a fascinating guy what a man <laughs> uh the, the other one is the away game in monster mm. i think it's, it's i don't think it was a semi-final i think it's a regular season game but Tipperick hits a, a beautiful line and Miles Harrison has kittens. He goes, Tipperick, oh, what a line. <laughs> <laughs> I watched that try recently again. Um, I watched that back of, genuinely last week. I can't remember why. It came up, um, as as happens. Yeah, Hassler finishing it. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, he's got it off to Hassler. <laughs> that's that's, that's, the, that's line. the line. It's, and, oh. then, and then there was the other game against Munster. The other one I remember was the semi-final yeah. where... Josh Matavesi, who'd had a kid that morning and got a helicopter over, then scores <laughs> the, the winning try. Helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Scores the winning try, uh, which is then disallowed for a Reese Webb knock on like four phases beforehand. And they didn't show any replays from the team. The TMO said it was knocked on. Nigel Owens blows up for full time. They didn't show any replays. And I was fuming about that for a week. And at the time, I was working for the, uh, I used to work at my old university, University of Derby. Um, and I was doing like the following week, we had a we had an open day. This is a long and boring story. I apologize. There was an open day, right? And a full family wearing Osprey's like jumpers come round. And I was so excited because you like, as an Osprey's fan in the Midlands, you never see this. Like I was so, and I was like, I leapt up and was like, I'll give this family the tour. No, it's not my turn. I'll do it. I'll show them round. And we just had a moan about it. And the, um, the dad kept saying, you know, I think they paid Nigel off in Ireland. You know, I think, I think he's on the payroll of Irish rugby. And he was really confident in that, that, that Nigel Owens was um, an Irish spy who was receiving great amounts of money from Munster. That that era was great. Uh, bring back the Sky Sports era, please. Yeah. <laughs> but just to bring back Miles Harrison. Oh, bring back Miles um, Harrison wh- in general. Where yeah. were we? <laughs> where were oh, yeah, good, good question. So time. everyone's injured. Yeah, everyone's uh, Jeff injured Hassler is that... going to play on the wing. Yeah, the, the ghost of Jeff Hassler is going to play on the wing. Um yeah, Will Hickey's back. That's brilliant. Um, we we'll, we'll, obviously we'll talk about the game uh, prior to the game. Mm. Uh, Lance Bradley, uh, new CEO and everyone's dad, uh, mm. spoke to SOC uh, and confirmed that the Ospreys were indeed searching for a new ground. Now we've been talking about this for weeks, and we're talking about the, the St Helens um, aspect of it. Lance has confirmed that nothing is in stone yet, although I personally think he's still in Porky's. Um, there, there, there is scope for, for all four of the, the, the grounds to be redeveloped. There's, there's arguments um, for all of them. Yes, you're, you're one who spent um, a considerable amount of time at all four of them grounds. Uh, what, on the, on the briefest of, you know, tangents, which one do you think would be best to, to redo? That's a, that's a good question. Um, because I, you, you put it this way, that you got the brewery field that's obviously had professional games there from the Ospreys in recent years. Then you've had the Nord who might have had one or two. But I really enjoyed the atmosphere of Swansea against Barbarians at St. Helens back yeah. last May. Obviously, that might might just been a one-off for that particular occasion. But I, I'm I'm slowly leaning towards St Helens, and I think Ben James had the exclusive interview with Bradley before before we went to TV, and um, I, my dad mentioned it to me, saying, "Oh, you know, I wouldn't mind moving out now to just to get one of the grounds in and and make make sure we get a, a good atmosphere in." So I think he was leaning towards St Helens as well. We had we had a bit of a a, a deep chat about this, funnily enough, on Friday night, and um, it, so I, I'm leaning towards St Helens at the moment. Just because it's probably you could easily strike up a partnership with the university in some way, I'm not sure how, and um, hopefully there'll be something done like that. But that's nothing against the other free grounds, you know. Aberavon have got some really good food, so if you're ever down there for a game, mm, good, good, it's a good selection yeah. of food. And and well, the Nol, the Nol's, the Nol was quite good. The, the press area is quite quite small, but. That was still all right, and then obviously you got the brewery field, like we've seen the last couple of weeks. That there's been used for poor rugby, but I'm leaning towards the Netherlands. Yeah, I was at that Barbarians game as well, uh, and the I was very drunk um, in in the standing bit, and we managed to blag um, 
the wristbands to go into Swansea RC's clubhouse, hmm. which was essentially like the hospitality bit because we got there and our, our mate coaches, like the, the Swansea schoolboys who were, who were parade around the, the field. And he gave us his wristbands and we were going in like to tiny because it was easy to get to tiny little space. We were going in and you could just see ex pros getting more and more pissed every time you we went in. So like Jiffy is just slamming back wines and like you you got like Reese Davis hanging out of a box at the top. And and then there's photos <laughs> of me at the end of the end of the game with like a load a load of load of players. And I'm just more drunk. Like I think I got to um uh who was it? Billy Twelve Trees and I'm I'm sunburned and just pissed, and, and I look awful. But I met Billy Twelve Trees in St Helens, and it was brilliant. And Sam Cross invited me out to Wine Street later on. Uh, no way. So, yeah, it, it, I, so I was asking him. I was like, oh, you know, where 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 were you going? Like, we going uplands and stuff like that. And he was like, yeah. Oh, we're going. We're going to X, Y, and Z. Do you fancy coming later? And I was like, oh, do you know, mate, if I could, I would. But <laughs> I have a feeling. I'm going to be having some paracetamol. I'm going to bed. <laughs> um, yeah, so but that was really yeah. But um, Lance uh, has said, you know, we're we're doing the, the the new stadium thing is coming. We don't have a timeline. Uh, what we do have though is sort of confirmation that the London game mm. is coming back. So uh, Matt Hardy of the City AM did an interview with uh, Lance Bradley. Today, in which he states, uh, Lance Bradley states that we will be doing another uh, London game at least once a year. Um, uh, shout out to Lance Bradley, by the way, for immediately shutting down Matt Hardy for uh, what he felt was a disingenuous headline and misleading, trying to make it sound like the Ospreys were migrating to London. Um, you know, we, we, we've been through the merger talk so many times now, and it's just so frustrating and so annoying. It's not fun for, for, for anyone, especially mm. for the, the job security of, of professional players. So fair play for him to come out and say that. And he's been very active on, on socials this week in and around that. Robbie, did, did yeah. you go to the London game? I did, yeah. Yeah, days so, after game back from the World Cup. Um, I got back that. on the train back to London. Yeah, I thought it was a fantastic experience. I really enjoyed it. Um, and being an English-based fan, as I was you know, mm. just mentioning... It's always something I've looked forward to, you know, since I've been 18 and since I've had the kind of free reign to do that. Um, I've always looked forward to the the Ospreys game in London each European season um, and have travelled down. Obviously, the Saracens game last year, there was a huge travelling contingent um, and Leicester likewise. And um, we kind of saw that again. And there was a lot of South Africans, you know, a lot of them delighted because they won the World Cup a few days beforehand at that point. Um but you got a real sense of atmosphere and of kind of, it was a very different experience to being at the Swansea.com. Um, and I enjoyed it a great deal. The way they really went all out to have, you know, Welsh and South African street food vans around. Mm-hmm. Um, they were handing out flags left, right and center. I've got one, you know, one of them just to my side over here. Um, it was a really fun experience, a really fun kind of trip out um if i were london based if i were a london based rugby fan who wasn't necessarily an ospreys fan i would be looking at that as something you can get excited mm-hmm. about as a different kind of event to go to which is something um Lance bradley says in the piece that you know you've got to look to aim this to people who aren't just south africans or welsh based in london yeah. but also for people who love watching good rugby and you can potentially be looking at internationals and toby booth made the point um after the game before that he reckons they could have got another, you know, four or 5,000 if they'd held it on Saturday or Sunday rather than on a Friday yeah. night. But that was just how the fixtures fell. And that was a general consensus, wasn't it? It was the the Friday. I think the Friday bit killed it more than the non, not having internationals. Yeah. Um, and obviously that's something that they will, they will look to do a bit better. Is the stoop the right place again? Do you think? Uh, the stoop's a fantastic ground. Um, yeah. The really important thing is supposedly um, the Osprey have made several times what they would have made holding the game at home because mm-hmm. Quinns gave them a really good split on food and drink and they sold more tickets than usual thanks to the kind of novelty factor, thanks to the fact they can bring fans from elsewhere and you had a decent number travelling down. Um, and then the fact that they weren't paying the overheads that they have to when hosting games at Swansea.com in terms of ground share, in terms of um, ground split, etc. So 
the Ospreys made a very decent margin back and have probably set up a relationship there that they can go forward with and they can probably agree similar terms with, which would be really promising. Um, it's a... Twickenham's a nightmare to get to, but at least there yeah. are travel links there. Um, it's, I think, easier to get to than the Stone X, everyone's favourite <laughs> ground that looks like a university campus. Um, <laughs> and then when you start to look at other, you're looking at football grounds probably um, at others. And I think actually holding it at that ground and maybe if they can organize it for a weekend where say, you know, that happens on the Sunday, on the Saturday, Quinns are playing on the Sunday. That'd be yeah. ideal. You can sell them as a kind of double. Maybe even if you've got the women's games taking place as well, that'd be fantastic. As having a full weekend of it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and ultimately the, the, the planning has to be a bit better. And I think the URC will, will take that into consideration because they saw how mm. much of a success it was. And it was a good game as well, mm. that Ospreys v Sharks did. And it, it's not to say that you have to do it against a South African opposition. It just helps that there's a lot of South Africans in South London. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, as someone who's an English-based uh, Ospreys fan now, um, you, you know, Getting to Twickenham is a lot easier than getting to South Wales for me. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's it's one train to Clapham and then I just have to go to Twickenham. Do you know? Mm. But like it, it it's it, it was really convenient and I'm gutted it was a Friday night and I couldn't go because I, I was in work. So yeah, it look, it's happening. I think that it, it, the, the ones who got annoyed at the London game were really the more casual Ospreys fans who um, who didn't get it? Like you know, mm. we we put out uh, the pod with with ACJ, and and he um, he did a lot to, to to dispel the myths. And actually, we had people telling us that um, you know we ch- we changed their minds and um, things like that. And actually, having someone as active as Lance Bradley um, will only further that. So, so yeah, I, I think we're in a much better position to say, yes, let's do the London game than we were maybe when it was announced in August. Uh, yeah, it was August because I was on holiday when it was announced. Um, sorry, I'm watching the under-18s again, right? It's, it's, the under-18s mm. is back on. It's Scarlets versus Cardiff. And the the most Welsh regional passage of players just happened. Scarlets have made a, a beautiful break up the field. They've gone to pass the ball inside. It's been slapped down for a definite yellow card, but the referee wasn't there because he's fallen over and like he might have done his Achilles <laughs> or something. Um, so it's that like a title <laughs> moment. The... <laughs> well, wait, the show and the replay now. We'll see, see if he goes down. What happens? <laughs> Yeah. It's like oh, Soccer yeah. Saturday, this. It is genuinely Soccer. Oh, right, yeah. He, he's, he's tripped over someone who's done his ankle. Um, if that isn't the most Welsh regional rugby thing, um, I, I love rugby. Um, the, the, the Cardiff physio is having to like divert her attention from her own players to, <laughs> to, to, to tend to, to, to Gareth Moore. Okay, um, <laughs> let's, let's move on to the game. This has been a, a podcast so far, definitely. Uh, so Ospreys uh, 25 uh, mm. USA Perpignan 3 uh, crowd of 4,500 which obviously isn't great but we've, we've discussed you know this is part of the reason why we need to get out uh, Dan Edwards kicked two penalties converted two tries a very very quick man scored two tries himself Yeston Hopkins building on his solid performances from last season before Keelan Giles danced his way around half a Perpignan to score. Uh, just going through some stats for the game. Uh, one that's come up a lot is um, our lineouts. Uh, mm. So Sam Harry played the full game. Uh, 21 lineouts, 100% uh, success rate. That is mental, by the way. I think we held the record before. Yeah. Uh, so uh, only it, twice ever in the Challenge Cup has a team. Bear in mind, this is the Challenge Cup, so you know. Yeah. Yeah, but um, has a team thrown twenty or more lineouts and hit a hundred percent? And the other one was also the Ospreys this season <laughs> against Montpellier. Against Montpellier. So something it, went right yeah. that day. 
So yeah, uh, and I, that's um, the huge work done to Richard Kelly, mm. um, who, who who sorts a lot of that. Um, I think flies there's a lot on the of radar a bit. He do, he really does, and he did I as think, a player as well. Yeah, Booth obviously gets a lot of the plaudits deservedly so, and Duncan Jones the work of the scrum, and I think Richard Kelly's work is underappreciated and I think it's done a really fantastic job across the board and I think I, because I think... people have this narrative that Dewey Lake can't throw they assume the, the yes. Osprey's line out shit and that is not the case that is not the case um, it's been fantastic the mall is obviously excellent and a few people go well Duncan Jones must be doing the mall himself or Toby Booth looking at himself and I think Richard Kelly's work's been really underappreciated I think he's done a fantastic job I think it's because we had a bit of a st- stutter in line out last year mm. that wasn't really consistent enough that we would have liked the Richard Kelly um, sort of it, his work wasn't appreciated enough, especially around the mall. And then this year now, our lineup has been very good. Yeah, like uh, and Lake has been since um, the Scarlets at home. His darts have been near perfect, and and, yeah. and you, you, yes, you 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 champion this quite a bit as well, don't you? Yeah, he's had a, a very good. Well, since he's come back from the World Cup, I feel. He's he's come in and played well. Obviously, you get the odd glimpse where maybe something does go wrong. Maybe the opposition reads it a little bit better than what yeah. maybe in advance from like a previous line. Now, like what Rory Thornton did in Regend somehow. I don't really know how Ooh. that happened. Rory <laughs> Thornton pinched a line note steal in Regend. Yeah, I know everyone might have been watching Blue Planet at that point. Yeah. <laughs> he managed to jump in front of Adam Beard and pinch line up ball. I, I really couldn't believe what I what I saw. But... Do you think you went off and did horny tweets to celebrate that as well? No clue. Yeah. But... Was I... <laughs> it's just my favourite Ad- Roy Thornton moment. He had a period where he did like three games, Cardiff won, um, and he just went and started posting horny tweets um, and like quote tweeting... You know, like first trap Twitter accounts and being like, "Oh yeah, baby," to all of them. Every but only when Cardiff won, it was fantastic. What? On, man. What, what? What? Yes, absolutely. Sorry, yes, and continue. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail that. <laughs> I've, I've lost track of every thought. No, that's just sort of <laughs> really Something Rory Thornton. Don't worry. <laughs> um, what was I? Line notes. Um, yeah, I think probably plaudits have to go to James Fender and Adam Beard as well. Obviously, you can do so much coaching and training, nothing against Richard Kelly's work, by the way. Mm. You can do so much in training against your own team, but when you put an interaction and, and go 21 from 21, yeah. you know, Lord, it's have to go to the players on the field. Well, well you say that, but James Ratty won the most lineups. I was going to get but, on to him later on. You, yeah, I know you were, because me, me and you have been talking about him all week. Yeah, have, was, though, um, you've got Adam Beard as a fantastic lineup caller. Um, yes. And I think it was something I had a bit, and I don't think I did end up using it in the video over the World Cup on how much better Wales's lineup is when Beard's calling it compared to, you know, David Jenkins is a very good player, obviously named captain of Wales yeah. this week. Um, he's still working on the lineup calling. You know, when whenever Wales have someone that isn't Adam Beard calling their lineouts, the percentage drops. Um, and the Ospreys obviously have had Fender calling the lineups points this season as well, um, but it's been really solid throughout, so, which is really promising. And I think obviously you've got him learning off. Beard and having one of the best in the game at calling lineouts, which like is a part of the game that I think gets um, under discussed and under you know kind of celebrated. Yeah. But yeah, I'm you know uh, I have wanked over uh, Adam Beard plenty in past and I shall do in future. As someone who is involved in lineup calling mm. at a very very low level, it is hard. <laughs> it is so, uh, and you're doing that at like, the, the professional level. Like again, I know we were playing against French carpet cleaners, but they're they're still there to 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 win, uh, and and we have varied that line out a lot. And actually, you know, you could see it at the tail end of last season as well. We 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 do run a lot of trick plays, especially when we have Sam Parry. I've noticed mm. this a lot. We run a lot of trick plays when we have Sam Parry. Um, the the best one being that 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 one last year with Ethan Roots put in Dan Liddy in for the Dragons game. And he, and he canters down the blind side, the things like that. So, yeah, Richard Kelly gets massive plaudits. Um, someone else who should get massive plaudits, who I think, you know, has been very, very good. Um, well, I say very, very good. He hasn't played in 12 months, but Will Hickey. Um, so Will Hickey came back. It wasn't his first game back because he played uh, for Swansea against New Bridgen, maybe? Oh, um 
It wasn't Newport because they played each other on Saturday. No, Newport the weekend. Was it Ponte? No, it wasn't Ponte. No, it wasn't. It wasn't that anyway, way. he played against one. He played for Swansea, but he came back with 12 months. He's had horrific injury problems, for, for, mm. especially for a young man. Um, you know, seven carries, lots of tackles, two turnovers, one. Um, did miss five tackles, did look a bit rusty. It was one way they broke down the blind side. I just yeah. thought, oh, William. Um, but yeah, he, he was really, really good. Um, really great to see him, but especially with all our injury woes, it's just nice to see him, to see him, you know, fit and ready. And, and finger tape stocks are going up. Um, through the I, roof. I think the, 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 the hickey missed tackle you're on about because. As the Perpignan winger makes the break, Luke Davis attempts a diving ankle tap from nowhere mm. and, and misses him. And then the Perpignan winger produces one of the best individual breaks and chip and chases I've ever seen. Thinking <laughs> it's going to be one of the best tries I've seen for quite some time, only for him to drop the ball over the line. <laughs> you know you know who would have scored that? Ali Crossdale. <laughs> <laughs> good player. Yeah, good player. Why isn't he playing today? Um, yeah, who who else stood out for you in that game, uh, Robbie? Yeah, I mean, I think Dan Edwards needs a mention. Um, it's a very different game to the previous week where I think he'd been fantastic um, coming on against Cardiff and obviously his cameras against Scarlets and so on. Um, this is kind of the first time that we've seen him be given the reins in the game and just having a full go, you know, because the game against Benetton, his previous start, he got injured quite early on in the first half. Um, yep. Here, he was given most of the game to try and settle. And I think the first 20 minutes, things weren't quite going his way. And this Perpignan team are a proper bunch of bastards. Like, oh. they were just niggly and horrible. I loved watching them. It's like you can take the team out the Pro Day Dub, but you can't take the Pro Day Dub out the team. Like, uh, Nemo... Yeah, Nemo Rasolfi... The the tight the tight end, pro. Mate, the best yellow card it. I've ever seen in my life. Phenomenal, phenomenal. And all game, he was just this kind of chaotic engine. Who, whenever he got yeah. the ball, he like in the way props used to do in like the eighties, where he literally put his head down and just ran without looking at where he was going. Um, just an absolute nuisance. And like the scrum off, um, Sadik Demache, who <laughs> spent the entire game waiting offside, just lapping people's arms. And, look, and, just and like, looked and looked so shocked every time yeah. he did it, as if he wasn't like told at least you know twice. And, and then when he got binned, and they had to take him off because like we just don't trust him to not keep doing that. We don't expect oh. referees to pick up on this. It's um, brilliant. I absolutely love it. But yeah, with like the scale of bass that they're up against, Dan Edwards and Luke Davis really controlling and settling that game, I thought was very impressive. Um, you mentioned, yeah, Fender, I thought had a great game as well. Um, and for me, I think the for me, if I were handing out man of the match, and I were not, um, obviously, yes, and Hopkins has the kind of big narrative moment. I thought he was fantastic. But Owen Watkin, mm-hmm. I thought, was brilliant. I thought he was yes. really, really great. Um, both attack and defense. He just... The Ospreys' defence looks so much more solid whenever it's him and Kieran, or whenever he's playing 13, I think, really is the main thing. Um, and obviously he was wearing 12 because of the last-minute change, but um, he was playing 13. And he defensively is just so sound. Every decision is pretty much correct, really deserves this Wales recall. And also yes. was really spotting things, ball in hand, his distribution. I just think he's been quietly really, really great for the Ospreys this season. And I think this was up there with the best he's played all year. Yeah, he, and that plays into this sort of narrative that. So I, I will have a bit of a rant about <laughs> Ospreys reverting to type, and we only score forwards tries, and we only score more tries. We passed the ball two hundred and twenty nine times this game, which is about a hundred more on our, than our average. And despite that, we still kicked the ball 28 times as well. Mm. <laughs> Dan Edwards has only ever been given the reins, like you said, at Benetton. And the other one was at um, Dragons in preseason, where mm. it did not mm. go well for him. That wasn't the game. And, and Booth said it just, just wasn't the game for him. And like you said, we go back to Boothy Bingo, time in the saddle, then cameo appearances. You know, the, the one against Cardiff would have given him a lot of confidence. And actually going into this game, I wasn't worried whatsoever uh, of him controlling the game. And we did, 
I even put it in in the group chat for 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 rap. I was like, we're passing the ball to to our wingers. We barely do this. <laughs> like, what what is happening? Like Keelan Giles touched the ball more than any. any I don't know he has in about three seasons. <laughs> Uh, and, and and no wonder he dropped four of them. He, he received about seventy three passes. Um, you know, if you, you look at the stats, we didn't make many post contact meters, and I, I I knew that before the game because they were such a physical pack. Mm. But they were they were really physical. But we had nine line breaks. I can't remember the last time Osprey had nine line breaks. You know, so our discipline was good. Seven penalties conceded. Um, a scrum percentage of 88. You know, on the face of it, and, and you can only play what's in front of you, right? Hmm. You can really only play what's in front of you, and we did. And, and we, you know, we're in this position where we're gutted we didn't get the bonus points, and, and that's that's what we are. But this team wants to play. They want to play for each other. You know, Yeston Hopkins probably sums up that. You know, he, he's, he's off the academy. You know, hmm. he's one of the academy boys, comes in. Really good, really physical. You know, he's so. I he, I don't realize how quick he was. He takes that ball off the off the foot of the the um, the Perpignan player, and he's gone. <laughs> you know, it, it's just it's just really refreshing to see because that could have been a banana skin game for us, and, and we all said that in in in, in the Irie group chat as well that this could, especially after that first half when you know. It's got to forty minutes. It's still nil nil, but they're knocking on our line, or three nil, whatever it was. And you're like, yeah, this could be a banana skin game for us here. It's the sort of game where I feel like a year ago, certainly two years ago, we would have thrown an interception pass, or we would have let off one occasion. There would have been something small that happened that would have turned the game entirely. Um, yeah. It's the sort of game where if we were going to win it a year ago or so, it would have been by a tiny margin. It would have been late on. Mm. Um, and the games like there are still games like that. You look at the Glasgow game that I think keeps coming yeah. back and haunting us a bit. But that is against one of the top three or four teams in the league, right? And we've progressed to a point where the games that were struggles a couple of years ago are now reasonably comfortable wins that we arm wrestle our way into, into winning. Um, I feel like there has been a really clear sense of progression season on season under Toby Booth, and we are seeing each year the Ospreys get better at winning these games and the caliber of games they're winning and the way they're seeing them out is getting incredibly impressive and as you say this was a really tough team they were really difficult to break down and yet and yet you came away with three tries and you know there was a mall chance five meters out where luke davis steps into touch or there was yes and hopkins dropping the ball and a hat trick opportunity there were two chances i think clean cut yeah. to take a bonus point and we can be gutted we didn't take it and that that never would have been the case a year ago or even potentially at the start of the season. Like, I feel like they're really kicking on. And despite having, you know, by the end of that game, about four players left and all of them under the age of 15, it was, yeah, just really encouraging. Yeah. Uh, yes, then, how, how, how did you feel? Any, you know, any, do, do you want to do your James Ratty piece now? <laughs> um, he was very good, I thought. I thought he was good mm. against Cardiff and Bridgend as well. You know, I agree. He kept himself quite busy. You know, there's quite often where he'd be standing in the backfield from a, from a from a goal line dropout, except for one exception where Morgan Moss ran through everyone and scored. That happened again. And um, I, but but then again, on on Friday night it was a bit bit different because obviously there wasn't many goal line dropouts for him to run onto for for starters. Mm. And um, it was just quietly going around the going around the park, doing his business, you know, jumping up an extra liner option, which we have seen countless times with Reese Davis at six, and we, we we've seen it again now with Ratty. And I thought he just he just went around the park and, and did a good job, you know, strong strong carrying game as well, which obviously helps as a back rower. And I actually want to give a mention to Matt Prothery. I thought he was quite good as well. Yes, I know that, yeah. Jesse Hopkins scored the brace, and Keenan Giles scored a really good try. But I thought Prothro had a good game. His first game coming back from in since um, Boxing Day, and I thought he was solid. You know, he's getting involved here and there, and he, he looked good. And I really want to say how good Owen Watkin was, but we've already discussed that. <laughs> <laughs> You're a big yeah. Owen Watkin advocate. It, it, you, it, it yeah, just felt, just felt really weird seeing them play in the wrong position because their shirt mm. was flipped. I was thinking this just doesn't seem right, but. Very often you see Watkins come in as a first receiver, and you, you see it quite a lot. 
Um, it's maybe not our first phase, maybe our second or third. Well, second phase is normally a forward carry, but maybe third or fourth phase when they're coming back against the green that you normally see Watkin in there and he's either popping them off to the forward or, or playing it out the back to someone like Dan Edwards. So it's just you know that, that little detail and Watkins defensively sound as a 13 and I, I think he, he really did deserve that recall back into the Welsh squad. Mm. It was something that really stood out about me to Dan Edwards watching in the 20s was how yeah. confident he is in that kind of, the boot position as they call it, that space behind the kind of first receiver. And Owen Watkin, the way he's playing is really allowing Dan, Ed- Dan Edwards to buy a lot of time for himself and to mm. make big decision and give great passes and you know kind of weigh things up which especially as a young 10 still learning to play at this level really important and really allowing him to kind of kick on and yeah hopefully we see more time in this adult boopy bingo um and yeah it's just like Owen Watkin I think is really really helping out with those two young halfbacks kind of learning the game as they go I think we saw a bit of Kieran that we haven't seen in a while mm. or, or if ever he was all of, he went. He goes around on that outside arc, and you're like, "Oh, hello! <laughs> I haven't seen this before." And then he's gassing people. He can't kick like we 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 know this, and we that love was, him. It's it. beautiful that Jack Morgan is a better kicker than Kieran Williams. Yeah. Like but, he is a back who bunts. He he gets on this outside arc, and he like does some does some really nice you know he does some really nice work. And you're like, "Hello, where has this been for <laughs> six years? Like since you made your debut, like." <laughs> It's Why are we getting Kieran Williams on the outside arc? Because he, he gets to a point like, what he what's he going to do at the end? No, no one's going to tackle him. He's just going to bounce you off and like spit in your eye or something. <laughs> I, I was really impressed by Kieran mm. stepping into a role that maybe maybe Dan Edwards can unlock in mm. a way. And, and you talk about Dan Edwards in the twenties, and I went back and watched the. Um, Wales v Japan game in the under twenties. That oh yeah, yeah. That Morgan Morse, you know, Mark Orders white, you know, wank train game. But it really says that Dan Edwards was a much better player when he has Bryn Bradley playing at twelve. Yeah, uh, and it's almost sort of in that um, in that mold of of, of what uh, of, of what Watkins does is is allowing him to give that time. It, it, it's what makes um, Smith look so good. Mm. Uh, at Quinn's because he has Esther Hazen. Esther Hazen gives him that time to to, to be so good. So yeah, you know, look, I'm all for it, and and you know, we're I I think we're in a really healthy position at ten that we haven't been in for a long, long time. I'm not saying Sam Davis and Dan Bigger. That, that, yeah, I'm not saying that that we're world class position because Stephen Miles not here. But the, the, that we have three tens who, when they're on form, all have different game plans, but all, I'm all equally as confident in. Like, mm. I, I'm so confident Jack Walsh now that he come on and close a game. I, I'm so confident that Dan Edwards could maybe kick on, start a game. I'm confident that Owen Williams could, can, you know, control that game. Mm. It, it's a really good position to be in <laughs> and, and a really exciting one, actually. And, and obviously, we're not the finished article yet at nine and ten. So. There's 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 so much more to go. Any more on that game? Yeah. Um, well, just like you mentioning Jack Walsh, I thought the way he played when he came on was perhaps not ideal for a team chasing a bonus point later on. Yes. But a masterclass in shutting a game down when you narrow lead ahead, which also very promising. You know, real lessons learned from Williams, I think, and not the sort of thing you would have been doing a year ago. So at the time, I was slightly frustrated because you're looking at the bonus point and you want to get that point on the table. Mm-hmm. But looking back on it, actually, I think showed a real sign of progress again from him, um, similar to Dan Edwards, because we forget how young he is and how green he is and, you know, yeah. how far he's come on in a year as well. So, yeah. Across the board, yes, and Hopkins, you haven't really mentioned as well. Keelan Giles' try, exceptional. Really great work. Oh, really? That was, like, 2017-esque Keelan Giles. Yeah. <clears throat> Bouncing through people. And again, really good for him. And, 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 and I feel like Toby both puts him in that environment where a lot of players will be really gutted if they don't get a Wales call. Mm. And I feel like Toby would just say, put Zara on him and say, no, just keep playing the way you are. Yeah. Uh, and it'll come. And if it doesn't come, you'll have done your best. Like, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, there's been a lot said about the, the Tom Rogers selection. And we'll, we'll come on to Wales selection in a minute. But um, yeah, Keenan Jones, brilliant. Yester Hopkins, 
we we've been looking for that maybe solid foundation after Nagy got injured, and mm. we've chopped and changed the fifteen a bit. You know, Walsh has done a fine job, especially in them trickier conditions. But really, you want you want a yes and Hopkins there, don't you? Absolutely, yeah. Um, speaking of Yestins, Yestin, oh, here we go. talk us through the Ospreys contingent that have been selected for Wales, and why have they been selected? Oh, that, well, that adds um, something. So first of all, we got Gareth Thomas, who's undoubtedly Gatlin's first choice loose head. Let's let's be let's be real. Here. Um, who has continued on? I think he's played quite well over recent weeks. I thought he had an absolute stormer against Bennett and in the league in uh, Europe. Yeah. Sorry, mm. we, we obviously scored that try, and um, he he's just kicked on. All right, maybe the the Welsh Derby's probably not as dominant as he'd like in the scrum on those two occasions, but. He's still probably well for Gatland the the best loose head in Wales at at the moment, um and that's that's a quarter of it done. I'm twenty five percent of the way through. The <laughs> he's been named into the Welsh squad. Uh, moving on, we got Adam Beard because well he he's Adam Beard, isn't he? That you know, yeah. a Gatland favourite. I feel, um, mm. and you know he, he he's probably going to be. Well, is it, well, now with David Jenkins being named captain and how good Will Rowlands was at the World Cup, it adds a bit of selection debate involved, especially in the second row. Unless you, which unless, is really healthy, by the way. Unless you move one, Wales fan. unless you move one at the six and try and emulate what the Ospreys are doing, mm. with like you see with Ratty and Davis. Um, but yeah, Adam Beard's in as expected. I did have him down as captain, so I'm a little bit disappointed that prediction didn't really come in. But uh, that, that's it for the pack because everyone else is injured. I, I feel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think that's it. And then you've got a, a centre pairing of, of George North and Owen Watkins. George North, of course, many a cap, over 100 of them. And uh, I think he, he'll be there as, as ever in the Six Nations. And he's, you know, it's good to have someone like George North in the squad to provide the, you know, plenty of experience towards the younger players in the squad. Someone like Mason Grady, for example, who's got a handful of caps and and will obviously learn a lot. And Owen Watkins back. We've obviously touched on this just now. Yeah. And I do well, I do think Owen Watkins has has deserved the recall. Um I, I always have a bit of an agenda. Why can't anyone <laughs> keep him in one position? Yeah. And, and mainly because Wayne Pivak did it quite a bit of chopping and changing, and then saying, "Oh, I actually want to in walking as 13. So Booth plays him at thirteen at the start of the season. And by the time the autumn came up a couple of years ago, he was playing at twelve. So um, that that doesn't really add up. But I feel like he's he's developed on his game that he's okay in both positions in a sense. Obviously, he's more defensively helpful at, at thirteen compared to twelve. Um and and he's he's doing, certainly recalled uh, deserved his uh, recall and that's it then yeah, <laughs> that is it uh, and before we go on to that big talking point of just four ospreys in in the in the Wales squad I have a hot take and uh, there's a lot of stuff flying around that if Johnny Williams wasn't banned he'd be in the squad over uh, Watkin I don't think he was I think genuinely that Watkin has played himself back into the squad yeah. I, I, I do think he's not been perfect this season, but he's been a damn sight a lot better than than people have made out to. I think Mark Jones coming in has almost like rejuvenated him a bit. Mm. Because, right, so Ospreys are a team that thrive off defensive pressure, right? So defensive pressure causes turnovers. That's where, that's where, we, that's where we thrive, right? That comes from a defensive line led by Owen Watkins. And you look at the games we've played and, and look at what Johnny Williams is doing. And I do have it out for Johnny Williams because I don't, I, I'm not a fan. I've never seen the hype beyond a club player. Mm. I think he's genuinely played his way into that squad. Yeah. I, the bet, okay. Um, I think every game I've seen Owen Watkins play this season. I would say across the board is better than the best game I've ever seen Johnny Williams play. And I might have missed the odd game for the Scarlet's where it was exceptional. I don't mm. rate Johnny Williams at all. I think he's a perfectly fine club player. As a test player, I think he's looked 
slow and ponderous and he's looked like his speed of thought and speed of kind of execution isn't up to standard. Um, and he has made stupid decisions across the board, be it, you know, handing Jack Walsh that try at Parker Scarlett's a few weeks ago, be it that red card. I just, I don't, I think he's physically an international player. I don't think his kind of speed and reading of the game is there. Um, to be, you know, very brutal about it. Owen Watkin had it last year, wasn't himself, wasn't his best mm, and yeah. didn't, you know, he missed out on the World Cup training squad. And I think that was a fair reflection of his season. Um, he was injured a lot. He didn't look quite comfortable anywhere um, whenever he was back. And, you know, Johnny Williams had a perfectly good year for the Scarlet's gone ahead of him. This year, I think Owen Watkins has been across the board. He's been playing week in, week out. Unlike, you know, the Scarlet's been chopping and changing their centers every single week, seemingly. And, you know, bringing in different players and different combinations and moving players from 12 to 13 and so on and so forth. Watkin has played 13 with Kieran Williams. And every now and again, he's had to move to 12 when Kieran's been injured with George North in at 13. He's played both extremely well, but particularly at 13, he's been absolutely fantastic. The way he's read the game, the way he's understood it, um, the way he's shut things down, particularly defensively, as you say. Since Mark Jones has come in, he's like a different player. Um, Toby Booth's mentioned he's defensive captain and he's really taken on more of a leadership role this year. And I think it's just rejuvenated him. It's just changed him as a player. And I couldn't be more made up for him. I was, he was the kind of guy I wanted to see in most. Obviously, I'd be delighted if Morgan Morris got a call up because he deserves a cap yeah. so much. He's been injured over the Christmas derbies and then Europe, so it makes it difficult for Gatland to perhaps pick him one. He hasn't been injured, and even if he's due back by the first game, you know, you kind of can't take a risk on someone when they're um, unproven. I get it. So after that, you're looking at Owen Watkin, and I think he absolutely deserves his call-up. Um, I know there's some hyperbole at the start of this ramble, but yeah, I think he's been fantastic. He, yeah. So Owen Watkin's been around for a while, right? I'm mm. sorry, I'm just looking... He made it so he's 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 directly a year older than me. We've got the same birthday. Um, he's so he's twenty seven now. Which if if you'd have asked me how old Owen Watkins is, I would have said he's eternally twenty four. <laughs> yeah. But he, he so he made his debut 2015, 2016. But as those fans of Squidge Rugby will know, he didn't. He, that seventeen eighteen season was his season when it worked. Mm. Where you know we, uh, particularly Saracens away, I remember he was very good. Uh, the, 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 you know, just sort of the the way we were playing then, and uh, was it Tandy and Clark that season? Yeah, because yeah, we, exactly. we attacked really well. Um, but you know, and then he broke into the Wales squad after that, and then you look at that. He 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 was a linchpin for that that. A, a very good Wales team, and was he just? No, he wasn't a starting centre for the twenty nineteen Grand Slam because that would have been Parks. But he was coming. He was off the bench. very. He was coming off the bench and every game, know, I think, in that um, six minutes. I think he started have... against Italy and came with the bench in all the other games. And so, yeah, I just think he's a he, he's a really really good player, like a solid player, and that mm. you know, at twenty, he's twenty seven now. So you know you, uh, uh, but he's one of them ones who feels like he'll stick around at the Ospreys forever, mm. and I'm fine with that. He's an Andrew Bishop. He's he's basically Andrew Bishop from Brinkett. <laughs> yeah, he's been a you know obviously played his hundredth game the other week. Proper servant, mm -hmm. the sort of guy that will retire an absolute club legend. And if he does leave, yeah. it'll be a really sad day because he's got that coming and lined up for him. He does have Pro D two written all over him, man. <laughs> That was just I the want, Perpignan forwards getting at him. I like, want to see the man play for like Breathe or someone like that and, and I, just fight everyone. I, I think so, let, let's talk about it, shall we? The elephant in the room. What? Four Ospreys <laughs> were chosen for a Wales squad. Mm. To, to, to quote Peep Show, four Ospreys. Four. <laughs> it, it, it's... It's unprecedented. I don't. Let, let's get out of the way. Injuries, okay. Mm. There, there, there are certain players who we know for certain would be in, uh, particularly Jack Morgan and Dewey Lake, um, which, which, which says to me that Dewey Lake is injuries a bit more serious than it than it seems. Mm. It's, you know, it, it's it might still be low grade, but it's enough to keep them out. And uh, 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 in a way, it helps because they don't need to look at Dewey Lake. 
Yeah, yeah. They, he, Gatlin clearly knows enough about Derry to say, you're my co-captain, you're going to be in the world squad for the next 10 years. And and it's, it's fine to have one off. He did say in the press conference that Lake would have been captain if not for the injury. Yeah. Um, so that was lined up. Yeah, you presume that's precautionary. Uh, Nicky Smith, he was also pretty nailed on. Yeah, um, who the loose heads called up Domachowski, Kemsley Matthias. Yeah, the I look, I have my opinions on Kemsley Matthias, <laughs> and and they are well known. The, what's worrying is the fact that we're down to. I think Domachowski is a very good player. I think he'll yeah. be Wales starting loose head. I think he has a lot of potential. Um, and then you're looking at Domachowski, and who's the other one? Yeah, oh, Gareth Thomas. Thomas. It'd be Gareth Thomas and Dom- Domachowski. There we go. Yeah, that's fine. But you, you would have assumed that Nicky Smith would have been in there. Yeah, especially knowing that Reese Carey wasn't seemingly wasn't considered, let alone, um, let alone uh, you know, Selected. be injured or whatever. Mm. Uh, again, we talked about hooker tight end. You know, the Tom Bowden debate reigns on. I, I'm not asked either way. Um, <clears throat> if it was going to happen, it would have happened by now. Gatlin mm. clearly wants to go younger, and that's okay. I'm a big advocate for Archie Griffin. Mm-hmm. And he's one who, if he doesn't break into Bath, and I am Toby Booth and Duncan Jones, I'm I'm going up to his house with a pint of cash and being like, you're going to come to the Ospreys and we're just going to have three very large men in that tight head spot at all times, like Ben Warren, um, Reese Henry, and him, you know, would be brilliant. Then you look at who who are the Ospreys that would have got the call up, right? Morgan Morris is the big one. If he wasn't injured, would he have been called mm. up? That's the question, isn't it? It felt like this was finally his time with Falatao injured, with the start of a new cycle, and then you wonder if it slipped away. You know, Mackenzie Martin coming and really deserving his call up, as did Alex Mann. Yeah. You know, all of those players that have been called up across the board deserve their shot. And obviously mm-hmm. Wainwright is the kind of incumbent. He'll likely be the starter. But you have a couple of young kind of apprentice types you can bring through over the course of a season, as well as James Botham, who I rate very highly as well. Um, you, I wonder whether he would have got in ahead of one of Man or Mackenzie Martin, one of the yes. MMs. Um, but, you know, it's a shame. I am surprised. I was kind of expecting Gatlin to go full Gatlin and call it Morgan Morse to, and then say, we want to have a look at him because that's the thing you always say. Yes. Yes, did we talked about this in the day in the build up? There was a lot of rumours coming out that Morgan mm. Morse was being called up, and Gatland was in Osprey's camp a lot okay. during the week. So in the in the promo video that the Ospreys always do, which are always great, Gatland and Howley are, are not only at training, they're on the sidelines watching training. So they're clearly mm. looking at people in particular. Clearly didn't look very fucking hard by him because he didn't choose any of us. And and, and Spoiler alert, speaking to Lance Bradley, um, who has a very, who has an existing relationship with Alex King, the whole Wales um, coaching team were at the game on Friday. Right. Again, clearly enjoying free hospitality and not watching the game. <laughs> um, or, or, or they must have been in the physio room talking to all our players. Um, yeah, so the, the, the big one for me is Morris. Um was he going to look at Morris? Part of me says that he wasn't going to. Mm. I think it would have happened by now. Um, and the other part of me says he might get called up in the summer. Mm. Um, take him to South Africa. The, the who who are the other ones that could have been called up? That's my kind of worry about Morgan Morris. Is if he doesn't get a cap by the end of this year, I worry it won't happen. Yeah. And he really deserves caps, you know. I'm really mm-hmm. invested in that. Just now, one. But... Luke Morgan yeah. has a cap. <laughs> Luke Morgan has two caps for Wales. Sam Cross has a cap for Wales. Yeah, against <laughs> all blacks. <laughs> <laughs> he got pulled off at half time, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um it, it's the same with Giles as well. Yeah. Like I the so, right, the Giles versus Tom Rogers debate at the minute. Obviously, Wales have lost a winger to the NFL um, and lost Faye Waboso to England. Um, so you're down two wingers. So you're really looking at you look at Rio Dyer and Josh Adams, you're starting wings. Okay. 
Gatland has said he, he actually quite like he likes to look at Tom Rogers at fifteen. I mean, mm. I quite to look, look at Tom Rogers on the bench um, <laughs> or in passing training. It's really I, I, I was surprised he got the call up. But I'm also surprised because there's no one else. Conby has not played at all. Um, Owen Lane's shit. Um, he's not. He's 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 just he's a club player. Yeah. There's no one else with the dragon. You're not calling up one of the Rosser brothers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're just thinking like Giles has been in red hot form, scoring some good tries, and he, you know he scores that on 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 Friday, and you're like, well, what more do you want from Gatland win? But I guess it's that. I guess it is height. I, yeah. as a pure rugby player, don't know why you wouldn't. You know, I would look at Keelan Giles as a better player than Tom Rogers, especially on the evidence of this season. Um, mm-hmm. But in terms of how you can fit them into a game plan and build a game plan around them, I understand why you go for someone like Tom Rogers. But yeah. I don't. You know, it comes down to what are you doing and what are you selecting. Giles's defense, the way he's improved on kick chase and so on has been fantastic um roger seems a bit like a blank slate the gatlin's hoping to mold a bit i think um and it was probably you're looking at him you're looking at if he was too early for yes and hopkins um yeah he's very probably, much too early for hopkins. i think he's someone you have a look at and you have in a kind of 50 man wider you know you probably bring him for one training session in the way they've done in the no, past he, no he, he but, plays against japan where we rely on like a nicky robinson drop goal to win <laughs> But like, yeah, Hopkins feels early, but he's sort of, you know, could make it there in the future. Someone that can play wing and fullback. And at that point, yeah, you are kind of like, right, was it, was it, were we looking for a third Rosser brother that perhaps, you know, <laughs> has something? Um, or were you, you know, trying to magic something else up? I don't know. Um, Toby Fricker could have been a contender if he'd stay fit, you know. But... Yeah. As a kind of Hop- larger Hopkins winger. is a really interesting one, actually, because he was the understudy to Cam Winnett mm. at under twenties level, and Hopkins has a, has a very very underrated um, under twenties highlight. Mm. He, he 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 obviously under twenties is a lot different of a game, right? Um, the way it's played, but you look at him like he he was really really good under twenty, and and Cam Winnett was was like a shit hard at under twenties, right? That series out in Italy, they they played against like mm. you know when Wales went much further than they had any right to win. It was very good, and, and Hopkins was a really good understudy there. He's definitely one you you look at like in a wider training squad because Cam Winnett just does have all that fundamentals of the game, and, and I'm really glad that Winnett has got called up. Mm. What worries me then is I actually go back to the back row, and I'm like. I think Alex Mann again really deserves that call up. He's yeah. a workhorse. He he's he's a bit like what Ethan Roots was for us, in that he all he does is he he hits people, makes tackles. He, he he's gnarly. He's a, he's a bastard to play against. Uh, and you you sort of look at that. Yeah, I get why you're called up, but we're also a bit thin at six, mm. and we don't have. He's the only out and out six in that squad. I also think there's something in the way the Ospreys have built a squad this season, which has largely injury and force chopped and changed a lot, but they feel like a team and players are plugging in quite easily, you know, so you see Tipper get injured, Jack Morgan plugs in, Jack Morgan get injured, Harry Deves plugs in, uh, Harry Deves gets injured, Dewey Lake plugs in. You know, they're yeah. kind of able to just bring these players in and change players into change. You know, as we mentioned, there's three fly halves. You've had Luke Scully play there as well. So you've kind of had four ten slot in yeah. and they look broadly the same. And maybe that does lead playing in a kind of cohesive system that very much feels like it's kind of own environment and own living organism. Maybe some of that leads to you noticing the individuals less and looking more to the scholars who are reliant on big moments from individual players. You know, the Eston Loy, um, sorry, the uh, Johan Loy's of the world and, you know, Sam Costello's and, and Tom Rogers who have produced individually great moments in a team that is otherwise struggling where the Ospreys are going broadly pretty well and maintain consistent standards but it means that fewer players are spiking and standing out. You know, we're obviously in the top percentile of fans in that we're doing this bloody podcast. But the average person who's watching the Ospreys a few times in the URC as a Welsh fan is probably looking at them and going, oh, that Fender's is a promising young player. And otherwise, you know, there's 
probably not as many players really standing out because the system is working well. And I wonder if that's hurt them a little bit. It's a really, really good point. And, and I, I, I was really upset yesterday. Mm. So, so, so for context, I, I, I was waiting on a phone call to find out if I got a job, right? Oh. Or I, I'd got another job yesterday. Oh, congratulations! And, well, it, it, I didn't get the, I did, but I didn't get the job. It's, it's okay. a really weird thing. I'll, okay. I'll talk about it off there. That's fine. I, yeah, I, I yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I was like, so I'm in two lines about that. Then the Zamit, the, so the Zamit news dropped first. So I'm essentially like, what the fuck? So I text um, a certain Gloucester rugby player who I'm, very, I'm good mm-hmm. friends with, and and I'm like, how how you know did you know about this? And he was like, no no no, we only found out on Sunday evening. And then okay, so that's happened. The Wales squad drops, and I and I genuinely thought it was a joke squad. I was like, no, four players. And then she so sort of goes through that stages of denial, grief, anger, whatever. And I'm there like, fucking 11 Cardiff. Like, Evan Lloyd, who the fuck is Evan Lloyd? Or like, you know, Kenzie Matthias and, and, and things like this. And, and they're like, but actually having talked it out with, with, with you guys, with, with like me and Yestin talk, and we have our little last race group with some other players, uh, other people, sorry. If, if, if we get a bit of good fortune and some injuries come back, like your Frickers, your Don Morrison's, your Will Griffs, you, you, you're, you're, you're hoping that Garen Phillips is, is a short-term thing, whatever. If we get some of these players back, your tipper ex, right? Ulster and Munster suddenly look mm. like really winnable games. Or at least you, you, you look at Ulster and you think, oh, we might get two points out of that. And then you look at Munster at, at, at the Swans.com stadium, you're like, hello, yes, please. Like a Munster without their internationals. And Munster yeah. with eight hundred injuries, and um, you know, and it's it's literally just Harry D was punching John Hodner all night, hmm. like which, it, 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 which I oh no, I pay for that, like I, I I'd physically pay for that, but he, he, we we have to look at the alternative, not the alternatives, the positives that could could come out of this hmm. is that we ride this storm now. We've got one game left of a thirteen game block, right? The players come back. We get we get your Tipperick's back, we get your Morris's back, whatever. I'm mm. looking at that squad that goes into Ulster and Munster, and I'm like, yes, please. When and then when I look at the players that Cardiff and particularly Scarlet to lose it, their their games in that period look a lot worse, <laughs> and 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 yeah. all of a sudden we're like, now you know, playoffs looked attainable. Now they look like really reachable. Like they they are in with a grasp do, do, do you feel yeah. the same way yesterday as well yeah I, I do i think that's what i kind of mentioned in all all of tuesday you know if every if every every ospreys player that wasn't named in the squad and they're currently injured if all of them were back for the ulster game you're thinking this is a really good chance here against against to get a win against an irish side you know you got someone like nicky smith Okay, we don't know how long his injury is, but if he if he were to come back, that would be a big boost. Even if he just came back for the Munster game, you know, someone like Alex Cuthbert that we haven't seen all season, you know, there's yeah. been a couple of rumours about him coming back quite soon. You know, Tip Brick is said to be back; he's back in training. You know, Kieran Williams is probably out in South Africa somewhere, and you know, obviously now he's back playing. That's a a key cog to the Osprey system. And you're thinking if you can add all these players back in, you know, someone like. Uh, Morgan Morris as well, you know, another key player to to come back in, and and you're thinking these these two games are, are really winnable. Edinburgh away as well, who aren't exactly firing at the moment either, who will be down a, a few a few of the Scottish players. You're thinking, do you know what? There's a real good chance that we can nick a couple of points from that Edinburgh games and put some real focus on the two home games, and. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But if it does happen, you're thinking top eight looks really good now. And there's a big game against the Lions at home right after the Six Nations. And yeah. That's another big one before the South Africa tour and Leinster away, all that nonsense. And you, you, you go to that Lions game off the back of, if you go, go into that game off the back of three heavy defeats, you're thinking, oh, this is going to be, you know, a bit of a tough outing. 
But if you go off the back of that with maybe a win or two, or maybe a couple of points here and there, you, you've got a real good chance of maybe even sneaking into that top eight. So, yeah. so just for context, our next games, sorry, Robbie, um, no, are ahead. Ulster at home. So after the, so we got the Lions away in the Challenge Cup. We're through to the next round, which we wanted anyway, and we will we will target it if we get Sharks and Durban, or we get, you know, if Montpellier beat Benetton, I I, I will buy a Montpellier shirt <laughs> because that means we most likely get Gloucester away, uh, yeah. which would be. You know, we'll do a live pod for all I care. <laughs> um, oh, we'll, yeah, so... we'll spend all week in Gloucestershire doing a succession yeah. of live pods. Cheese rolling. <laughs> um, uh, so we, we've got Ulster at home on the 18th of February. Winnable. Mm. Edinburgh away, 1st of March. Depends on what state that Edinburgh squad is in. Um, after last year, I've got a bit of PTSD. Yeah. Um, and then Munster, uh, Munster at home, and then Lions at home. That block of four, it's not out of the way Ospreys are playing, and that system we talked about earlier, Robbie, where no one's shining but everyone's on the on the same threshold. Yeah. It's not, it's not out of the so, reach to say that's three out of four. Absolutely. <laughs> so to basically to make the playoffs in the URC, right? You're looking at winning 10 games. The target, the only team to ever win 10 games and not make it was the Osprey season before last. Um, 10, 10 wins basically gets you in, providing you pick up some bonus points along the way. We've got five bonus points already, which we got six that season. We didn't make it in. So, you know, one or two more bonus points and it should be okay, providing you get those 10 wins, right? We're on five at the minute and we have five home games remaining. Uh, no, sorry, four home games remaining, which means basically, right? Um, you're looking at two of them are regions. Um, so no, sorry, so the, the li- lions. Sorry, lion dragons lions. Uh, both outside the international window. So both games are target. Hopefully the lions are in. They're in in between South African derbies and European knockout games. So hopefully they take that as their rest week. Um, yeah. and they're in a reasonable position. And they go well. We'll just rest all of our you know big players there. Um, it, you're then looking at right judgment day. Could potentially be that away win um, mm. if you can then target these two games against the Irish teams as two home games to try and get those wins or Edinburgh. Um, so Ireland, uh, sorry, so um, Ulster and Munster are each missing seven players in the Ireland squad, which are significant losses and they are players in key positions across the board. Um, so you're looking at, you know, both their halfbacks being mon- missing for Munster very decent chance that both of them are going to be in the 23 regularly, so probably won't be back for that game immediately afterwards. Um, as well as, you know, the, their captain in Peter Armani now being the Irish captain, and perhaps their front row is still in reasonable shape, but, you know, I think it's only uh, Jeremy Ollie Lachman Yeager's that's going. Gone into, no, Ollie Yeager's oh, it, yeah, travelling panelist, yeah, training yeah. panelist, whatever that means. Um, but then you're looking at like But they also like, don't Tyburn. have like a dog bow and players like that, don't they? A dog bow yeah. over the season. They've got um, a billion injuries. Yeah. You're suddenly looking at that as a you know, a game to target. And as you say, Ulster have been incredibly up and down this season. They've been either brilliant and absolutely on fire or really just falling over and not being right. Um again, they're gonna be missing a lot of their really key players, the you know, um Ian Henderson's, <laughs> Nick Timoney, um, who feels weird every time I see him in an Ireland squad, but like is a brilliant club player. Uh Stuart yeah. McCloskey. If all of those are missing, suddenly that is targetable. And Edinburgh, which is a game, when I looked at the, you look kind of looked at the, the score for the season, right? I figured we had the two games in South Africa. Um, there was two games away. You had Connacht away, Leinster away, and Edinburgh away were all basically unwinnable games. You had to write off, and you had to, from the other 13 games, scrape together those 10 wins. Um, and actually, suddenly, Edinburgh have 13 players currently in the Scotland squad. And yeah. that is huge. That is basically and one of those is spine... not Javin Sebastian. <laughs> yeah, you have the entire spine of their team gone. You, they're an injury or two away from missing the entire fifteen, entire starting fifteen. Uh, there are positions in which they're missing their first and second choice players. It's kind of enormous, and suddenly that opens things up. If this is an Osprey squad that gets a lot of those players back, there's a decent chance if. You know, a Dewey Laker and Nicky Smith does come back to fitness. And Gatlin doesn't call them for immediately because he wants them to get a bit of game time for the Ospreys. Suddenly, we could be going in missing 
four players, you know, because um, Owen Williams is still going to be there. He should be back. You know, hopefully Justin Tipperick will be back. You're looking pretty much across the board. You're going to be missing the four um, players with Wales and Jack Morgan, who's out until after the Six Nations. Yeah. Um, it suddenly starts to feel like you've got a strong team and you've got a strong chance of targeting those three games. And yeah. then at that point, if you're on eight wins with two to win and like five games left the season, the playoffs is really in our hands. You can win the two derbies or target that Lions game and the two trips to South Africa are kind of write-offs, get any points you can. I've waffled a lot, but like this, you know, obviously disappointed for the players individually, but as an Ospreys fan, this is not that bad. There's a silver lining at, the, at least. And yes, then you look at the teams we're facing, right? We've got Munster in this period. They're intense. So we beat them. They're not coming up above us. You know, we wrote, so we've got Ulster who are in fourth, but we're only three points behind them. Mm. So actually we close the gap. Realistically, we're not going out to South Africa and getting points. So you, Stormers and Bulls are, are, are seventh and sixth, respectively. So they, they, you, you imagine they're going to shoot up during this window and, and probably take that three and three and four spot. Then you look at Lions. Well, they're in eleventh, but you know Lions has been a bit of a banana skin game for us. Again, you, you like like Robbie said, you're hoping that they choose that as their rest week. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's not bad. And then and then we play the Dragons at home, which historically has been a very high scoring affair for us. Um, I don't want to jinx it because mm. I hate playing the Dragons. Yeah. Um, but at home, it's it's generally been quite a happy hunting ground. And then if if we go into that last day, just having secured playoff rugby and not having to worry, we're not going to drop out and, and, and we go against Cardiff, I, I'm not asked. Do you know what <laughs> I mean? If we go, we go into that game and we're like, playoff rugby is all but secured. We only need a point. So I, I, I'd be I'd be sitting back in my chair, but I'd also be like, Christ, we've been so much better this season than we've had probably have any right to be. Yeah, and I know we on paper probably have the best squad out of the four regions, but to still get that result, you know, Cardiff still have a very good squad and they're playing a very good brand of rugby, but can't buy a win. The things like that, you know, the Scarlets on paper have a good squad. There's just not clicking there and, and things like that. So. From what started as a negative with having four lads in the in the Wales squad, from, from, you know, from having, if you look where we were at the start of the World Cup, it was 13, for fuck's sake, in a 33-man mm. squad. Obviously, that changed because of transfers and stuff. And we ended up with six. It, it presents an opportunity. And, I, and actually, Booksy Bingo finding a way, you know, it, it's a real opportunity for us. Uh, is that it for the Wales chat and debate? I think it is. I think we've gone through that in a really respectful way. Good luck <laughs> to everyone. Good luck um, to everyone. Look, yeah, it's it's going to be a tough Six Nations. We're in transition, but fuck it, we ball. Um, also, I want to give a big shout out to a certain someone who has been called up to the England squad. I feel like a prank dad. Mystery <laughs> and Roots. Um, I, I am a big Ethan Roots fan. I was when we signed him in that. He's, he made his debut against Cardiff and gave away like three stupid penalties. And I'm like, I love you so much. Um, and, and every game, he, he was one of them ones that we like the Sam Mundell thing. He grew every game and he was just so. And, and when he left, you're like, Christ, yeah, you're good. And you're going to be good for Exeter. At no point did I think he was England good. But then mm. and I'm like, it makes complete sense. This is exactly what England want. He carries well. He he hits everything. He's a leader. And you're like, yeah, fair play to him. He's worked his balls off to get to where he is. And, mm. and, he, and he's a nice guy as well. Fair play mm. to him. And a, a huge congrats to him. Um, a huge congrats to Dav Jenkins as well, being captain. Yeah. Um, obviously never been involved in the Osprey setup, you know, ever. Or very very limited, but he, he's still a Porth call boy. He's still part of the region, and, and we're going to claim him um, <laughs> before Cardiff do. Um, <laughs> let's move on to uh, the Lions away. 
<laughs> Christ, we could have done well at this game. Um, so, like I said at the top of the pod, the, the boys are out there in Johannesburg at the minute. Um, good news, George North has flown, Kieran Williams has flown. Um, no word on who else. It'd be interesting to see which fringe players have, fro- have uh, flown. We're looking at like a Jack Regan. You can you assume like a Will Hickey may start in this, things like that. So Jack Regan, you know, is we're gonna see like an Alex Ashton off the bench, maybe Cameron Jones, no, not that one, the other one. Um the the, the prop uh, might have gone out, things like that. So yeah, it'd be really interesting. And, and it's a free hit. Because mm-hmm. actually if you know Montpellier beating Benetton is Unlikely, but would still be hilariously fun. Yeah, it, Benetton may choose to rest up for this one, actually, because they've they sailed through, haven't they? Yeah, They're three from three. Yeah, they batted Newcastle last week, didn't they? Yeah, um, so Montpellier are two from three. Uh, or three from Montpellier three. three from three. Uh, they're on so fourteen actually, points. Benetton are on oh. eleven points. Whoever wins that wins the group. So, uh, yeah, so Montpellier should go full but, noise for this. Yeah. If Montpellier win this, they finish as, presumably, they should. Yeah, if they win, they finish as top seed overall, um, yeah. regardless of getting a bonus point or not. Um, mm. Whereas if, basically, it'll guarantee them home tie. Um, if Benetton win it, they will win the group, but probably, depending on bonus point situation, um, probably finish as the third bot. You know the the bottom seed of the top seeds of the group winners, um. Yeah. So that all depends. Um, the way I kind of went through all of the fixtures in my head, just kind of going, what's a likely result for all of them? That is the one that feels the most undecided and the one that has the biggest deciding factor on things. Mm-hmm. Um, if most results go the way you'd expect them to go, um, then you're kind of relying on yet yeah, that and the sharks against the dragons is the other one that could swing things. Um, yes. But you're probably looking at the Ospreys finishing as if they win the game, which is very unlikely with the state of this, you know, the situation they're in. But it would be the most find a way boofism thing ever achieved if mm. they do. Um, then they're looking at a home game against one of the teams dropping down from the Champions Cup. Um, so you're looking at Bristol, Bayonne potentially. Racing um, 2 <laughs> Racing 92. <laughs> um, yeah, good luck. Um but if they lose the game, they're probably the most likely scenario is they're looking at whoever finishes the second seed, um, the second or third seed, um, of the group winners, which is looking like the Sharks, Gloucester, and potentially you know whichever Benetton or um, Montpellier comes away with it. So if Montpellier win, Oof. we're probably yeah. yeah. It, it's a really oh, you want Gloucester away out of that one, don't you? Absolutely, that's the most winnable and the probably the most fun. The Lance Bradley Derby, um, <laughs> who it, it's like a it's like a, a a money in the bank match. Whoever wins gets custody of Lance Bradley. <laughs> um, you don't really want the Sharks away <laughs> in Durban. No. Um, equally, it would be hilarious to host like a Bristol, <laughs> like seeing Harry Thacker. In all his glory, or like, but, but I, I, I don't want to see the superstars of Bristol. I want to see like James Dunn, or, <laughs> or like James Williams. <laughs> like, you know, that's the proper Bristol. That's that's the Bristol that would have played in the champ. <laughs> like, um, it, it, it's a really tough one, and, and actually, you know, I'm really looking forward to that. Mont- if Montpellier win, and we're like, oh, we could have Gloucester here. If we could pick up a point in in the Lions, you know, because Gloucester, it, not only for the Anglo Welsh shit, um, but it is our genuinely best chance to win a knockout game. Yeah, um, it feels like the kind of game that this Ospreys team wins is Gloucester away in the last sixteen. You know, yeah. like it's a big statement win in a big famous club. Um, I was trying to think when's the last time we played Gloucester. You're probably going back uh, a long, long time. Do we play them in a preseason game? Okay, have... in a competitive game because I think mm, it's like no, 2007 you, the last time they played. You look like an EDF, and then yeah, in it, yeah. Well, 
I saw them play, I saw the Ospreys play Gloucester in, I would say, about 2010's, like, EDF Energy Cup. Um, and the Ospreys lost 17-0. Um, James Hook had a particularly bad game. Um, did, did he damn me a lot? <laughs> yeah. No, I think he threw an interception pass late on. I think it was, oh, like, Jesus. 10-0, and they were, like, really struggling. But, like, they can pull this back from here. And then... Oh, no. um, we played in the Anglo-Welsh Cup in 2018. Okay. That... I'm gonna find sorry, I'm gonna find that team sheet now. Oh. Here we go. I can't um, remember if the same season as they played oh might have been oh no, it was the season after, wasn't it? So oof, oof, oof. Oof. Cardiff away and oh, okay. with a brilliant try. Okay, oh. right. I've, so. I've just looked up details of that 17-0 game that I watched the Ospreys lose. Uh, Ryan Lamb with three penalties to put them 9-0 ahead, right? He then kicks a drop goal, then late <laughs> on James Hook throws an intercept try and Ian Bolshaw scores. <laughs> the ghost of Ian Bolshaw. The ghost of Ian, right before he goes to bloody um, Biarritz in order to score against us in the next knockout game we play after that. So, do you want to play a game of guess 15? Oh, okay, 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 yes. okay, okay. So, this is um, Gloucester. This is at King's Home. So okay. This is Gloucester oh, um, uh, versus Ospreys in 2018. So let, let's do, uh, for, for context, I will go through the Gloucester team so you show you what you, you, we were sort of going up against. Okay. So, um, uh, loose head for Gloucester was a man called Cameron Orr. I have no memory of this man. Uh, nope. At number two, Richard Hibbard. Yes. Um, oh. Hero. Uh, number three, Fraser Balmain. Uh, a young, would have been a young phrase, a younger phrase of our main there. Mm. Four, uh, Ed Slater. Uh, five, Mariano Gal- Gal- Galarraza, who I don't re- remember. At Gal- all. Yeah, yeah, he was a solid, yeah, solid Argentine second row. Well, speaking of solid and safe, at six, at seven was Will Safe. Um, <laughs> hey, nice. Six was Freddie Clark, who's a lot older than I. Uh, I yeah, realize. he's like thirty-one now. Um, I went to, in the moments of the year script, he comes up for his like diving finish. And I'd yeah. written in the script, like, Gloucester, young Gloucester lock, Freddie Clark. And I checked, and he's like 34. I was like, <laughs> right, okay. How has this happened? Uh, uh, eight, Ben Morgan, of course. Yes! Um, number nine, Callum Braley. Oh, what went wrong? Ooh. Ooh. Number 10, a young William Burns. <laughs> Billy Burns himself. <laughs> 11, Ollie Thorley. Now, this is when Ollie Thorley had this a breakout is, season. Yeah, peak Ollie Thorley time. This is when he scored that amazing try versus Leicester. They put Kyle Easton in his arse. Uh, <laughs> 12, Mark Atkinson. Uh, 13, Henry Trinder. Underrated combo. Uh, 14, Henry Purdy. Good player. Oh, good player. Uh, <laughs> good player, Henry Purdy. <laughs> 15, David Halifanua. Um, Again, a player I don't reckon uh, remember that much. Uh, weirdly, on so Henry Walker, bit of a name, Paddy McAllister again. Ben Velikot was replaced with the scrum half. Okay. Oh wow. Um, and and Tom Hudson, good player on Rugby Challenge. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, okay, so let's go into so, the, the, the Osprey squad. So, Osprey who do you team. think was that loose I've, head in the Anglo Welsh Cup in 2018? I've got oh. a couple of names for different positions, but. Was Rodri Jones a loose head? I think they just switched him back. No, right. Rodri Jones was a tight head and on the bench this oh. game. Oh, okay. Um, who is about in the? Because this is the this is this is Alan Clark era, isn't it? This is peak Alan Clark. Yeah. Yeah. So right. wouldn't be Nicky Smith, would it? This no, wasn't it was one of his exile it was periods. Gareth Thomas. Gareth Thomas. I was, was, I was thinking Pat. him, but I couldn't think so, of side. <laughs> He was done so the second. He was fourth choice when Booth joined. No, uh, yeah. Hooker. Uh, Scott Orton. Of course. Yes. Uh, number three at tight end. They wouldn't have. They wouldn't have started uh, fear, would they? He, no, it wasn't fear. It, it wasn't any of. So Rodri was probably the most senior prop in the squad. Uh, Alex Jeffries. It was Alex Jeffries. Oh, Alex yeah. Jeffries, the groundsman. No. <laughs> Uh, number four, we've mentioned him tonight already. James oh, Ratty. It was James Ratty, James Ratty. yes. Uh, James Good. <laughs> James Good, yeah. Of that uh, era? No. Yeah. 
Number five was um, he wouldn't have been his son. He, he changed his son after he got married. Lloyd Ashley. Well, oh, Lloyd yeah, Ashley. Well, Lloyd Pierce. Lloyd um, Pierce. Robbie, you've mentioned this guy in your in one of your fifteens before at number six. Ooh. Um, it's the shit one, not the good one. I oh, think I um, know he's a seven. Bloody Guy Mercer. Guy Mercer. Yes. Guy Mercer. <laughs> Guy Mercer was at six. Uh, who was at seven? Yes, in was it Will Jones? It was Will Jones. The, the oh man, the, the, man. The, yeah, the man who yeah. never was. Yeah. yeah, what a miss that was. Imagine if he came through now under Booth. What a... um, num- number eight. Um, the ranks. Morgan Allen. No, close. Rob, Rob McCusker. <laughs> very far away. Very close. Oh. <laughs> it um, was Morgan Morris. Morgan uh, Morris. It was wow. young Morgan Morris uh, at, at Scrum Half. Ruben Morgan Williams. Because I'm pretty it sure was. he scored that night. It mm. was Ruben. Yeah. Uh, at ten. Uh, Luke Pitt. Luke Price. <laughs> Yeah, of course it was Luke Price. It was going Price, to be no yeah. one else. Was it? <laughs> it's a game we um, lost in that era. Yeah, of course it's Luke uh, Price. Bless number him. eleven is 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 current Welsh Premiership uh, player. Yes, oh, Jay Baker. Jay Baker. Yes, Sorry. I'm pretty sure one of the only <laughs> games he ever played for the Ospreys. Uh, Twelve. It's it's in his dummy era. James Hook. It, it was Hook. It was the the goat. It was the the creep inspector of, of James Hook. 13, uh, I'm not going to say his name because he's an arsehole uh, and, uh, and assaults homeless people. Um, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, 14. Uh, who, who, was, who was the other winger in this period? Never got his big break. Hanno Dirksen? No, he got his big break. Okay. It would have been, it Tom, have... Tom Grabham? I was thinking Tom no. Grabham. Good, good shout. Tom Williams? Tom no. Williams. Oh. It was Dav Howells. Dav Howells. He was, oh, he's man. at Leeds now. That's how. Mm. Yeah. Good player. And then at, at 15, who do you think was at 15? <laughs> Sam Davis. Who, no, who always but, slotted in at 15? Oh, Dan this Evans, sorry. Bad. No, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't Dan Evans. He was in the main squad at this point. Oh, yeah. um, but Dan Evans played every game for like four years. I think, think, who, think who was Davis. coming up in the academy at that time. I'll give you a hint. He's just been named in the Wales squad as a 10. Kai Evans, a fullback. Kai Evans, Oof. at fullback. Oof. Um, uh, I'll go through the bench quickly. Uh, yeah. Ivan Phillips, at 16. Nice. Rowan Jenkins, obviously part of the, the mm. um, Expendables. Uh, 18, Roger Jones. 19, a man called Kieran Martin, who I have no mm. memory of whatsoever. You used to play for Jend a couple of few years ago. Okay. 20 is Josh Cole who is Ivan Phillips' best friend, I believe. Hmm. Uh, 21, uh, the other person who assaulted um, a homeless man. Um, 22, Tian Thomas Wheeler. Oh, what could have been um, Tian? Uh, and then 23, Dewey Cross, uh, oh. Cardiff, uh, the Rags legend. What a team. What a team. <laughs> what a team. What's funny is, that's not... That's the year we lost 44-0, wasn't it? Or was that the year after? Yeah, was, that, was, that was about then. Yeah, the year after. Yeah, that's not a dissimilar team to what lost forty four nil to the Scarlets. That's how far we've dropped. Uh, well, that's how far we've come. Sorry, uh, sorry, we are on a really bad tangent then. Uh, yeah, we play the Lions with no players available. On, on yeah, um, it's kind of a free hit. You know, if something comes in, get any points. That's wonderful. I'm not yeah. expecting anything. No, we we go out there. You play for pride. At the times we got out to South Africa, I don't think we've ever played that bad. I think mm. we just played a sixty-minute game and then dropped off. Yeah, a bit like a bit like Cardiff do now. They play a sixty-minute game, and Harley talks about this on Cardiff Central and on the Wrap. You go all out for sixty minutes, and it's just not enough. Yeah. Um, again, it'd be really interesting to see what he does rotation-wise. I think you might see Jack Walsh starting, um, as well as like a Hickey. Um, Ben Warren, things like that. So, I think yeah, it's a lot of rotation. It just enforced. Lewis Jones probably going to yeah. have to get his first start. Um, you've kind of got mm-hmm. no other choices. You probably need to keep the midfield similar to last week. George North might need to play wing, depending on where we're yes. at. Yes, uh, Giles out there. I'm not sure on Luke Morgan. 
Okay. Yes, then do you know when Luke Morgan if he's out there? I think he might be out there actually. Okay, that's good. So right, we're getting a yellow card. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so you you you'd imagine the squad is looking like if fit, maybe it's either Henry or Phillips. Yeah. Parry, Bota, uh Lewis Jones. Christ, here we go. Adam um, Beard. Adam Beard, yeah. If he's uh, if he's got, I assume he's got out. Yeah, Adam we kind Beard. of don't have a choice but to play him. Um, you look at a, uh, a well, Hickey, Ratty, Morse, Ratty, Morse. Unless there's a chance, if Deves was returned to play HIA, he'd yes, be back. He, you can imagine. I think he has gone out. Mm, um, okay, then it, is Ruben back? Um, so you look at a Luke Davis. Cameron Jones has gone out, so I assume mm-hmm. you look at Luke and Cameron again. So you look at Luke Davis, any one of Dan and or Jack or Scully. I, I assume you look at Jack or Dan. Yeah. Um, Kieran and Owen, maybe North onto the wing. Um, Giles Hopkins, maybe a Harry Houston. Um, Hopkins a fullback. Hopkins a fullback. This is. I would have loved to have taken off Tom Florence out. Yeah. If he wasn't mm. injured. The problem becomes the bench, right? Where the front row is okay. Like you've got players who played regularly there. Yeah. But second row, I don't know if there physically is anyone. Um, you probably so need to have Ratty Keller. Alex Ashton is Alex the, Ashton, uh, the second row that's um, uh, registered. And he played it for Swansea against Newport, didn't he, Ashton? Yeah, he was. I think he came off the bench, I think. So he's got okay. some minutes. Then you look at this, has Tristan Davis returned for return to play? Is Jack Regan available? Um is have we had any word on Hugh Sutton back? You know, do you know what I mean? So mm. Cameron Jones stops. The backs are looking okay because you you can go like a Cameron Jones, uh Scully and Harry Houston. So it was a bit yeah. lightweight. Prothero will have gone out as well unless he went off injured. Um so so it it is bare bones and, and, and the issue is if it was a league game you're fine you can call up on mm. players maybe in Welsh Prem or, or emergency loans but because it's a European game you're limited into what you can into who you can take because you have to have registered players so it's going to be tough um, I did have the referee written down but I lost it Yeston do you have that to hand? Uh, no but I think he's French so anything goes Oh right, yeah, break, break yeah, we're fucked. Uh, breakdowns a mess. Uh, yeah, so really, really uh, going to be a tough old time. But I'm looking forward to it. Sunday, one o'clock. I assume this will be on via play. Yeah, I I checked yesterday, so I think good. It's on. So which hey, you know what else is on via play? Oh, oh here we go, Robbie. <laughs> <of the week. laughs> it was uh, coming. Love is all you need. A Danish rom com starring Piers Brosnan. Um, what? Which it no link whatsoever to the Beatles song of the same name. No idea why it's called that, other than the fact that the Danish title translates to the hairdresser without any hair. So I presume they just went, that's just not catchy enough. Um, it's a really charming rom com by Suzanne Bray, who went on to make Bird Box after this. Okay. Um, uh, really lovely rom com. Her idea was she wanted to make a rom com that felt like popular by real people rather than the kind of cutty, like cookie cutter thing that you get from. Um, you know, most rom-coms. It's really lovely. Piers Brosnan is really good in it, uh, which is not a sentence you can say about every film, um, even once he's in, um, especially once he's in. Um, but yeah, I think really, really sweet little film. Long, t- Probably about 10 years since I saw it. But um, yeah, liked it. Good stuff. Not quite 10 years. Probably like seven <laughs> okay, years. Okay, so, so we've got Glove is All You Need, weirdly starring Piers Brosnan. He was really strapped for cash for this. Oh, Jesus. desperate. Desperate. <laughs> No um, link to the Beatles song, which I still don't understand at all. And again, weirdly, Suzanne Beer doing it, who also did the the Night Manager as well. Yeah, which is a brilliant show, and written um, by Anders Thomas Jensen, who is a brilliant like um, Danish filmmaker. Made a film called Rise of Justice with Mads Mikkelsen a few years ago that I thought was amazing. It's one of my favorite films of that year. Um, and a film called Men and Chicken, which I think I mentioned before, where Mads Mikkelsen compulsively masturbates. But, um, but he also he also wrote The Dark Tower. Yeah. So he, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, he, he he's gone down in my book. Right, let let's move on because we do have an announcement actually, don't we? Mm. Um, so um, we've talked a lot about Lance Bradley 
um, and you know he's our dad. Um, Lance Bradley has agreed to come on to the podcast next week. We are. Um, I have been in contact with him all week. He's been really, really good. He reached out to us. Um, I mean, after a bit of poking and prodding on Twitter, um, and you know, huge thanks to everyone um, at, uh, tweeting him and, and saying get on the pod and things like that. So the way it's going to work is we are going to run it as a uh, as like a supporters Q and A. Anyone's listened to the Dragons Lair podcast and their interview with David Buttress, which I highly recommend going to watch. By the way, it was brilliant. Um, so if you have any questions for Lance Bradley, um, you need to tweet to me at Osprey's Irie. Um, don't tweet yesterday and Robbie um, because <laughs> it will get lost. Um, <laughs> I will put out a tweet at some point with um, like an official one to say, put your questions here. I'll also leave it on Facebook in any Osprey supporters groups that I am a part of. Um, if your question doesn't get chosen, it's probably because it's been asked and, you know, because we, 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 we will understand we're going to get the same questions around stadium, money, sign-ins, whatever, okay? Um, we really can't wait for this. This is a really big really big thing for us um, mm. we've been keen to get a relationship with the Ospreys going so to, to, to get in with Lance uh, is brilliant um, please get down to the Ospreys this Ulster Q&A before the match with Lance uh, on the 18th of February um, it's a really good way of getting your question across you know we can only ask so much um, and we don't want to take up too much of Lance's time but he is genuinely committed to improving us. He is genuinely committed to the Ospreys. This is not a PR thing. This is not something that's... He's not in it to make money and, and all this. He he believes in the vision, okay? So, like I said, I will put out a tweet. Um, huge, you know, Lance, if you're listening, huge thank you. Um, it's been, you know, something that we've really wanted to do as soon as you've got an episode. So next Wednesday, um, obviously we will um, we will still talk about the game and everything, but the majority of that episode will be spent talking to Lance Bradley about his, you know, time with the Ospreys. Um, so that is a really, really, really exciting thing because there are no games, um, and if I have to talk with the Wales Six Nations squad again, I might cry. Um, <laughs> other than that, gents, any messages? Any 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 shout outs? Any messages? I haven't um, got. No, I haven't got. I don't think I've got one. You haven't got one. I mean, a big shout out to the. I did look up the um the Ospreys team that played in that Gloucester seventeen nil game, and it is far <laughs> too good. Is depressing. Oh, okay. So shout out to Gavin Henson, Tommy Bow, Sonny Parker, Andrew Bishop, Shane Williams, James Hook, Jamie Nut Brown, and the forwards and the bench. I'm not even going to go through it. It's depressing. It was a full strength team apart from Jamie Nut Brown. Shout out to all of them for giving me a miserable day as like a 12 year old. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to all of them. Um, I would uh, like to give Ryan a shout out to just, just, uh, just to everyone on Twitter. We have smashed 200 followers. Um, uh, over the weekend, I took over this account from Lee, who you know obviously is juggling for different podcast accounts. Bless him, uh, and you know I was just wanting to hit a hundred followers, maybe have some, you know, concurrent listeners that that we that we just have a little community builder. But we smashed two hundred followers. The engagement on on the Twitter has just been out of this world. You know thousands of impressions and, and it's not everything but it really makes a difference when you're not shouting into a void um, and that's what Welsh rugby feels like sometimes <laughs> we, we like we like to keep it light hearted we like to keep it shit posting and, and, and things like that and you know we we, we appreciate everything that comes our way um, you know we're, we're eternally grateful for Robbie for, for essentially becoming a, you know you are a full time <laughs> presenter on here now and, and you know like you're family. you're doing so so much in in the rugby world and, and you know it just shows how committed you are to, to the to the club and to mm-hmm. the vision as well. So yeah, um it's exciting times to be an Ospreys fan. Mm. Um it, it really is and get on the journey and you know we're hopefully starting out to our re signing soon. 
Um, but seriously, it, it's a great time to be an Ospreys fan. So thank you to everyone for listening. Uh, you can find us in all the regular podcast links, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, as always, you can find the boys on their socials, uh, yesterday underscore uh, Thomas21 at Squidge Rugby. Or if you want to weird ramblings about films, uh, was it at Squidgy Goat? Squidgy Goat, Squidgy uh, Goat. Yeah. yeah, I always enjoy that one. It was just for the change of pace. And I, I, I also appreciate when you want to boost engagement, I get likes off both your accounts. Yeah, well, I just <laughs> come up on both. And I'm just like, well, I, I liked it on the other account. It feels false if I didn't like it from both. I didn't change so my mind when I'm no longer thinking about writing. And, and then obviously you can follow the pod at Osprey's Irie. You can follow me at James Reese Eight, but again, I don't really tweet much. Um, apart from Leicester, apart from Leicester, I'm looking at my tweets, and it's one of my own rugby jersey, and Leicester being bad. Um, <laughs> uh, I will remember to tweet out the link for Duncan Jones uh, cutting off his hair. Absolute legend. Other than that, we will see you next week for a huge, exciting episode, and hopefully, celebrating um, a good. Round of 16 draw. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good week. Thank you for listening to the Osprey's Ari podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Please subscribe, rate and review wherever you listen to us as it really helps spread the word. You can find us on all the usual social media channels or email us on welshregionalrugbypod at gmail.com. And remember, whatever the question, rugby is always the answer. Sports Social Podcast Network.